we have learned in the previous modules that this two level system that is so useful in developing the concept of uh, stimulated emission and spontaneous emission is uh, actually useless as far as uh, making lasers in real life are concerned. So, what we will see in this module is what happens when we have more levels than two. But uh, before going there, let me ask a question about two level system. See, the way we uh, introduced it was that when you perform the semi classical treatment using perturbation theory, time dependent perturbation theory, then you get an idea about absorption and stimulated emission. And then we said that it was the genius of Einstein that brought in the spontaneous emission term in the kinetic equations he wrote because it is there, it is real. But I hope you have not forgotten that we also made a passing comment that even then the picture is not complete. Can you tell me why we made that statement? Why is the picture not complete for even a two state system? Even if you consider absorption, stimulated emission and spontaneous emission. What have we missed out on? Yes, so we have missed out on something that uh, is actually the focus of our research entirely. We have missed out on the non-radiative re relaxation. Even in Einstein's treatment, non-radiative relaxation was not there. So, that comes in uh, as another, yet another term in the kinetic equations and when you bring it in, then you get all those relations we have written earlier, the rate constant of non-radiative processes, quantum yield and lifetime, they are related right, 1 minus phi f divided by tau f. So, that is where that comes from, but in the discussion that we are doing so far, we are pretending as if there is no non-radiative relaxation, which of course is not correct and it does not give you a complete uh, picture. But in the discussion that we are going to do now, we are going to invoke rather non-radiative processes to understand the situation uh, albeit qualitatively. I mean one can uh, go ahead and do uh, a lot more kinetic equations and convince ourselves what the situation really is for a three level and four level system. But once you have done two level system, rest of it is uh, just an extension, you can do it yourself. So, we will not try to do it in the course. I will draw the picture, perform a qualitative uh, discussion and then move further ahead. Okay. So, two level system as we said is not good enough to give you net, spot, net stimulated emission. Okay. What about a three level system? Suppose I have another energy level 3 and as said we are going to perform a qualitative description here and the situation is this that you promote the uh, molecule from energy level 1 to energy level 2 and let us say that there is some efficient non-radiative relaxation pathway that quickly brings the system down to level number 3. If you read textbooks on laser, in many cases they have not used non the discussion of non-radiative pathway, they have stuck to uh, discussion of radiative pathway and it might as well be. There may be a radiative transition from 2 to 3, the only condition is that it has to be fast. Then what happens? And let us say, so uh, an example that we will all understand is, let us say that state 1 is S0 ground singlet state, state 2 is S1 excited singlet state, state 3 is a triplet state. So, in that case this non-radiative process would be ISC and as you know ISC can actually be promoted by using heavy atoms and all. Okay. There are mechanisms by which you can actually make ISC uh, very efficient. Of course, uh, purists would say that in that case the state number 3 is no longer a triplet because uh, when you invoke a heavy atom effect then what you have is you have spin orbit coupling and it is no longer a pure triplet state. But uh, that is fine, I mean we can still go ahead with the fact remains that it is not so easy for the system to come back from 3 to 1 anyway. So, as we know triplets have a long lifetime, so it is sort of a 
quasi permanent state right then what will happen let us say that this process takes place in a few femtoseconds or few picosecond let us say and let us say that this state number 3 has a lifetime of uh, let us say microsecond microsecond is enough how many uh, picoseconds are there in a microsecond two picoseconds are there in one microsecond please come back to the linear world yeah so can we try again how many picoseconds are there in a microsecond 10 to the power 6 right 10 to the power 6. So, uh, what I am trying to say is that before a molecule can come down from 3 to 1, if these are the lifetimes, a large population of 3 can actually be built up. If this process 2 to 3, radiative or non radiative, whatever, takes place in picosecond time scale and if lifetime of this is microsecond also, then before a molecule that go, goes here can come down to the ground state, this 2 to 3 conversion will take place maybe 10 to the power 6 times and 10 to the power 6 is a large number. So, what is happening? For a sufficiently long lifetime of this state number 3, its population will build up n 3 and n 1 will keep decreasing ok is that right. So, what you are doing essentially is that you are pumping population from state 1 to state 3 through state 2 and if this 2 to 3 relaxation is fast enough and if state 3 is sufficiently long lived then you can achieve a situation can reach a situation where n 3 can become greater than n 1 and then you can get spontaneous emission between 3 and 1 is that right have you understood what is going on. So, for what we have discussed now n 2 is populated from n 1 we can say instantaneously time for transition is at a seconds. From 2 to 3 that population takes place very efficiently ok femtosecond process let us say. What we are saying is 3 is very very long lived if all the numbers work out nicely and that is you can get an actual feel of the numbers if you work out the differential equations. Then you can hope to achieve population inversion between 3 and 1 and once that is achieved you can have lazy has everybody understood and that brings us to something that is very very relevant to our uh, core discussion that of a pulsed laser. So, you see as long as so initially think of time 0 population of uh, state 3 level 3 is 0 population of uh, level 1 is almost in total. Now, think of say 1 nanosecond after you have started light is shining right the pumping light 1 to 2 that is shining. What n 3 is building up, but still perhaps it has not reached population inversion. So, for the first 1 nanosecond there is no lazy for 2 nanosecond also maybe there is no lazy maybe after 500 nanosecond or 1 microsecond or 5 microsecond provided lifetime of 3 is long enough population inversion will be achieved. So, if you think of the output of the laser there is no lasing for a long time right, but when population inversion is achieved this is the important part then all the population will want to get depleted by stimulated emission at one go right. So, the output you will get will be something like this and then again if this 1 to 2 uh, radiation is on 
population of n3 will keep building up and the laser will be silent x axis is time y axis we can say is intensity of the rays. Keep going going then after the required amount of time once again there will be a burst of light and this will go on provided you keep the pumping on. So, for a three level system like this where 2 to 3 transition is ultra fast and 3 is ultra long lived you are going to get a pulsed output case in point ruby laser. So, this is one situation. Now, we will come back to level 3 also uh, level 3 once again, but let us talk about a uh, four level system first. Let us say I have a situation like this 1, 2, then let us say there is 3 and 4 and situation is like this direct transition uh, is possible between 1 and 2. From 2 to 3 you have an efficient non radiative pathway from 4 to 1 also you have an efficient non radiative pathway. Can you actually have a system like this? Well, suppose you have intramolecular uh, proton transfer excited state intramolecular proton transfer right then it is possible. Then if you look at the uh, energy profile then most likely it is going to be like this. Okay. So, I will draw a schematic molecule some OH is there and a nitrogen atom is there. I am not even drawing the rest of the molecule here. So, what I am saying is this is the ground state corresponding to it. Then you excite and in excited state proton gets transferred to nitrogen excited state intramolecular proton transfer. So, if, okay, even before going there if ground state this is the situation what I am saying is that nitrogen being protonated that is uh, not an energetically favorable situation. So, that is when you have this asymmetric double well potential y axis is potential energy right what is x axis you can say bond length for now or reaction coordinate. So, you have asymmetric double well potential what happens when you excite as we might have discussed in this course acids are more acidic bases are more basic in the excited state OH is an acidic group N is a basic group in the excited state due to change in acidity and basicity proton gets transferred. So, now this locally excited state for this one is no longer energetically stable. So, when you excite then you are going to reach a state that is actually energetically less stable. So, excited state potential energy surface you can expect is something like this. This state is OH double bonded to N. This excited state is also OH not double bonded hydrogen bonded to N. Then proton transfer has taken place this is hydrogen is covalently bonded to N hydrogen bonded to oxygen this is the corresponding ground state. Okay. So, if proton transfer is sufficiently facile what will happen you excite immediately proton transfer will take place and then whatever emission takes place will be from here to here. But then since this is energetically not favorable the moment it has any population it will come back to this four level system. So, that is why ESIPT molecules have been touted for a long time as good candidates for uh, making lasers because they are actually four level system. But now see what kind of output we will get let us write when you start population of n 1 of 1 is n 1 what is population of 2 0 this is 0 this is 0. A little while later so n 1 equal to n total you start from that a little while later what happens this decreases a little bit population of n 2 is still 0 because there is an efficient uh, non radiative pathway to level number 3. All right. Level number 3 let us say has some lifetime whatever. So, N 3 population is there what about N 4 what we are saying is if you look at this diagram 
the moment level 4 is populated, it goes back to 1. So, N4 population is maintained to close to 0 at all times, this is important to understand. Here, if the rate constants are such that N4 concentration is held to be near 0 at all times, then what will happen? Population inversion is already achieved between third level and fourth level. Because even if there is like two molecules in N3, population of uh, fourth level is 0, right? So, in this case, what kind of an output you will you get? There might be an initial induction time, but if you neglect that, you get a continuous output. So, this is an example of an the first one, third level, three level system is an example of an intrinsically pulsed laser. This is an example of an intrinsically continuous wave laser. So, I told you an example of a three level system that is actually uh, something like this. Does anybody know an example of a four level system? Something is very, very common and not necessarily in ultra fast. I do not exactly know, it must be a diode laser. So, yes, most likely yes, NDIAG laser is what I had in my mind. NDIAG laser is perhaps the most celebrated example of a four level laser. So, it is supposed to be continuous, right? So, you see that NDIAG lasers are there that are that have continuous wave output and then you see NDIAG lasers that are uh, pulsed. So, uh, what I am trying to say is NDIAG lasers are actually intrinsically not pulsed. Intrinsically, they are CW lasers. If you want to make them pulsed, if you want to get pulses out of them, then you have to do something yourself. And that doing something yourself is either Q switching or mode locking. So, that is what we are going to learn in the uh, subsequent uh, modules. Maybe not very sure whether it will be exactly in the next module. We have not made up my mind yet how much I want to talk about gain and loss and uh, Q factor. Perhaps we should do a little bit, but eventually we are going to talk about mode locking. Okay? So, remember something that is intrinsically CW can per force be made to give you a pulsed output. Okay? And it is not very difficult to understand as well. The light coming from that lamp is CW, right? And the detector I have is my eye. So, I keep it shut. I do not see it. Then I open it for a small time and close it again. So, that way the detector that I have actually gets uh, pulse light out of a CW source, right? Or I could use a shutter, well, my eyelid is a shutter, okay. But here I cheated a little bit because I talked about uh, shuttering the uh, detector rather than the laser itself. What I can do is maybe I can keep it off for some time, turn on the switch uh, only for a short time uh, periodically. That may not be a very good thing to do because it might spoil it. But there are other ways we can use different kinds of shutters by which a CW light can be made pulsed. And that is what we will learn in detail because that is that is really something that is very important to uh, our course of study. But before we leave this discussion, let me talk about another kind of three level system. When I say another kind, three level system has to have three levels, cannot be held there. What I could cannot really do much about two to three also. But suppose now I have something in which this 2 to 3 conversion is radiative and 2 has a long lifetime. Three to 1 is non radiative and fast. Of course, there is a catch here. The catch is what about 2 to 1 emission? We will uh, come to that. But for the moment, you tell me if this is the situation, 
then what will happen? What kind of laser do I get? First of all, this is where the lasing will take place, right? Between 2 and 3. Will it be CW? Will it be pulsed? It will be CW. So, you can have three level systems in which the output is continuous wave. It is not necessary that whenever you have a three level system, the output is going to be pulsed. It all depends on the relative rate constants, okay? But now, who will take care of the 2 to 1? 1 to 2 absorption is taking place. So, 2 to 1 can also take place and I am trying to have induced emission. So, do I have some way in which I can force the system to give me lasing in 2 to 3 and not 2 to 1? Yes. So, energy density matters, right? Do not forget energy density is another factor here. So, if energy density of new 2 1 is very low and energy density of 2 to 3 is high, maybe you introduce some photons from somewhere of that energy, then you can make a laser emitting in uh, that particular frequency. And this is actually discussed in Macquarie and Simon's book. In my edition, the page number is 603. Here, they have talked about a three level system and you see they have considered all kinds of, uh, if you look carefully, there is no uh, non radiative uh, transition here. It is radiative all the way, but they have set the conditions in such a way that you have a three level system where the lasing is between 3 and 2 and the output is continuous wave. So, I uh, would advise you to try and uh, work out these problems. You see, finally, you get an expression of N3 by N2 and so on and so forth. So, do it yourself and satisfy yourselves that this is actually the case. Okay? We will move on a little bit uh, and give you uh, a quick glimpse of what is to come. Okay? And let me show you, since I have the book open, Instead of drawing, let me just show you the diagram. This is what you have inside a laser. I think this is something that all of us know. How do you make a laser? How do you get amplification? What you do is, first of all, you need some pump source. You have to create that appropriate excited state. Pumping can be done either optically or electrically. You can have some light source. So, uh, if you see uh, older NDAG lasers, they use flash lamp to excite. So, in the laser that I used as a PhD student had this NDAG rod about this big and on two sides there were two flash lamps. So, the arrangement was like this parallel. You can think that the blue pen, you better look at the projection then you will see. Blue pen is the YAG rod and let us say the black pen is a flash lamp and you have another flash lamp on the other side and we had this parabolic mirror. So, light from here would be focused onto the YAG rod. Of course, 25, 30 years ago, things were much more primitive than what they are today and there is always this problem of heating. You have this flash lamp on all the time and it is pumping. So, th things would get heated. How do you dissipate the heat? There was this actually very nice, if a little cumbersome design, where this whole thing was immersed in a tub of water. A tub is about this big. The whole thing was in water. So, of course, that water had to be uh, distilled water and then constant temperature had to be maintained. So, there was secondary cooling and all. But, you know, if you use a bulb, sometime or the other it goes bad and if you are unlucky, these flash lamps instead of just dying on you would uh, burst. And then whether they burst or not, to change the flash lamp, we had to take out like 12, 13 screws, drain the water completely, then salvage broken pieces or the unbroken flash lamp from there and change it. So, those were more interesting days. So, that is one way of pumping. What we do now in a diode pumped solid state lasers is that you have a diode bank which gives you light, which is directed by photodiode onto the YAG laser. And 
whoever has used that laser would know that there is a chiller that provides cooling, but things are not as messy as they used to be earlier. Now, it is not necessary that you always do optical pumping, you can do electrical pumping as well, but let me decide whether we want to talk more about that later. And then you have this, I do not know if you can read the projection, here then you have this gain medium. Gain medium or active medium that is the molecule or material or ion which actually gives the emission. So, if you are talking about ruby laser, your gain medium contains ruby. What is ruby? We will come to that a little later. I will show you if you can read. And then what you do is, all right, em emission takes place. And that emission uh, photon that, that are there, you have two uh, mirrors on two sides. So, for photons that go to this mirror and typically you have curved mirror because you want to focus here so that you have a higher density of photons. So, let us think of one photon which has gone here, hit this mirror, come back and when this photon passes through the gain medium, it is going to experience other ions or other molecules or other material that is excited already by the pump source. You get my point? First, think of it like this pump source. Let us think of it as excitation light, 1 to 2 excitation. Okay? I have done that and some emission has taken place. Let us say it is stimulated, it is spontaneous emission, does not matter. It can take place in all directions, but we are talking about this mirror. So, a photon that goes and hits this mirror comes back, retraces its path. Now, when the photon comes back to the gain medium, it is going to find other molecules or other ions, whatever the gain medium is in excited state. Who has taken them to excited state? The pump source. Is that right? It is a pump source that is exciting the uh, components of the gain medium. The job of the photon that is initially emitted and has come back is to cause either promotion of unexcited molecules or de-excitation of already excited molecules. This finds both. Okay? And that is where uh, this discussion of gain and loss and all that comes in. Maybe we will do it later. So, think of this photon comes, depopulates one ion or one atom or one molecule in the excited state through stimulated emission. The important thing to understand is what we are drawn at the beginning of the 1817, 16th, whatever it is called, 16th module, 16th lecture. Remember, the photon that comes in is not absorbed, it goes out itself, but it de excites a molecule and causes the emission of a second photon. So, now you can think like this a photon goes out by whatever mechanism of emission, comes back, causes stimulated emission. Now, two photons come here, hit this mirror, come back and they cause two more photons to come out. So, in every round trip, the number sort of doubles in the best case scenario. It does not always double, it will always be less than two actually the factor, but it increases. Okay? So, in a very short time, okay, how much time does a round trip take? Let us say, let us do a simple calculation. Let us say this length is 1 meter. So, round trip would take how much? Start from here, okay, go here, go here and come back let us say, complete round trip. It is travelling 2 meter in that case, okay, let us say 3 meter, let us say 1.5 is the cavity length, then it is easier. Then round trip distance is 3 meter, what is the speed of light? 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second, this time we have not made a mistake. So, you can calculate how much time it takes, very small. right? So, if you are talking about some seconds, in a few seconds there is a huge amount, a huge number of photons that is produced okay? and that is called gain, increase in number of photons. But now, what is the point? I mean, uh, see if you are a miser, you work very hard, earn a lot of money, keep everything in an iron box. And then when your time in the earth is over, of what use is that money to you, right? So you have to spend it also. 
So, if you are going to make a laser, it is not enough to just have a lot of gain. You have also need to have a little bit of loss. I mean, light should come out. And the easiest way in which it is done is that on one side you have a high reflective mirror, reflectance 100 percent. On the other side, you have a partially reflecting mirror. So, 95, 99 percent reflecting mirror, 1 percent will come out. Okay. This is called the output coupler. We will discuss these terms again in more detail. Okay. Then what will happen? So, initially when number of photons is small, you hardly see any output because say 1 percent of light is coming out. Let us say I am being a little stringent here. But when there is a lot of gain, there is a build up, then 1 percent of that amount is also good enough. Then you get laser light coming out from this side. Okay. This is the a simplest way in which you can uh, depict a laser. Now, we will get into more complication. What happens? What should a cavity length be? I arbitrarily said 1 and then I said 1.5. Is it arbitrary? Can I have any uh, laser light even for CW? And if I want pulsed light, what is the more stringent condition that comes? These are things that we will slowly get into, but let me complete this discussion by showing you another page of Macquarie. If you cannot read here, please go back and read in your home. This table 15.2 in Macquarie and Simon provides you a compendium of some solid state lasers. And what you see is chromium. So, it is important to understand uh, what this is. We always say N D ag laser and forget about it. It is important to remember what is the role of a, what the role of uh, N D is and what is what the role of YAG is. What is YAG? Yttrium aluminum garnet and uh, what is that? It is actually Al5 O15. Okay. Y3, Y3 Al5 O5. Have you heard the word garnet in any other con context? It is a precious stone, jewelry, yes. Have you heard of ruby in some other context? Of course, you have. Okay. So, all these precious stones are precious to us not because we want to wear earrings, I mean not all of us, but because they, are, they actually make good gain media. But it is important to understand that it is the dopant, the iron that is actually the emissive species. The role of YAG or YEL for glass, all that is to provide a support. In fact, when you talk about ruby laser, natural ruby does not give you good laser. Ruby laser invariably has synthetic ruby which is grown so that the crystal structure is good and all. Natural ruby is not very easy to make use of as a laser material. So, uh, here the last example that is discussed is our good old titanium sapphire laser. Here this T i 3 plus ion that is what gives you the emission. Okay. And sapphire again another precious stone is Al 2 O 3 that is the uh, matrix. Both are important. I mean, titanium in some other matrix may not be as stable as titanium sapphire. So, good thing about uh, why are precious stones precious? I mean let us say I make stone of sodium chloride crystal of sodium chloride, I can call it a stone, right? It is not going to be very precious or calcium carbonate that is actually a valid stone. Why is it that calcium carbonate is not so precious as ruby? Because the answer is same as if I ask you why is gold precious? Because gold does not react. Right? You make very nice jewelry out of iron, then eventually they rust and it is not there anymore. Even silver gets black, but not as bad as iron. Gold does not react, that is why gold is uh, so precious, platinum is precious. So, here also the good, the, uh, these precious stones are precious because they are so stable, they do not uh, react to the like, slightest moisture or some other gas that might be present. So, that is why you want to make these as support material, this is what your titanium sapphire laser actually is. And you can also have gases as gain media. You can, a Heaney laser is something that you might have heard. Uh, before the advent of diode lasers, Heaney lasers were uh, ubiquitous. 
especially where alignment was involved. Now, in many cases, they have been replaced by diode lasers because now you have uh, good quality diode lasers which give you nice transverse mode and all. Okay, but that will be uh, discussed sometime later. The point I'm trying to make here is that your gain medium can be many different things. Can be solid, can be liquid, can be gas. But it has to satisfy certain properties, three level or four level at least, and stability is an issue. Uh, can, do you know of any uh, laser where the gain medium is liquid? Well, when I say liquid, I mean a solution. So go to the next lab. You'll see dye laser. So what they do is they dissolve uh, something like rhodamine 6G in methanol and keep it in cuvettes, excite using a green laser and make a laser out of it. Again, as PhD student, I used what is called a synchronously pumped dye laser. We'll discuss what synchronous pumping is. There, we used to flow the dye. We wanted picosecond resolution. You cannot use a cuvette. So you actually flow the dye and you have a jet of dye coming out and it is caught by a, what is called a catcher tube and that takes it back to the reservoir. And the green laser was focused onto that jet of the dye, like no medium, so that it doesn't become broad. That was also uh, rhodamine 6G, but not dissolved in methanol, it dissolved in some uh, viscous solvent so that the jet is good. Okay. So, we will come to those uh, one by one. I wanted to do a calculation today, but maybe we will leave it uh, for a little later when we actually discuss dye sapphire laser. Right? So, uh, next day onwards, we talk a little more about lasers and finally, we are going to arrive at pulse lasers. Mm -hmm.